Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Sherry Ann Charleston, inaugural Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer here at Harvard University. Please note that closed captioning will be provided for this event and that this session is being recorded. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural event of our community dialogue series, Leading in the Midst of Polarized Times, a conversation with the 71st Governor of Massachusetts, Governor Deval Patrick, followed by a panel discussion with experts from across the university. We hope you will also join us this Friday at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time for Bush v. Gore, 20 years in retrospect with attorneys David Boyes and Theodore B. Olson, the attorneys who argued the case. It is now my honor to introduce our president, President Larry Bacow, the 29th president of Harvard University, who will introduce our panelists, our event for the evening, and welcome you to this event. Larry, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sherry Ann, and uh, I want to welcome everyone. It's, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to all be together, if only virtually. This is how we do things these days in this most unusual of, of years. Um, I want to thank Sherry and her team for helping to create not just uh, this evening's uh, program, uh, more about that in a minute, but also this series of, of programs. Uh, since Sherry joined Harvard and my senior leadership team this summer, um, she's brought, I think, extraordinary energy and enthusiasm uh, to her job. Uh, it's an important job. Uh, she's gotten to know students and faculty and staff. Um, and I think she's learning in the many ways in which um, diversity, inclusion, and belonging really matters, not just at Harvard, but in the larger world. Um, I'm very excited to see what she's created here, and I'm confident that she's going to do great work um, together with us, pushing us, challenging us to all be our best selves. Um, as Sherry mentioned, this is the first in what will be a series of conversations. Um, and uh, she already mentioned Bush v. Gore, which is um, in the works, but also following the election, um, we're planning a series of, of continued conversations. Um, these are hosted not just by my office, but also by Sherry's office, the Office of Diversi uh, Diversity, Inclusion, and, and Belonging. And uh, I hope they will be conversations which will model the behavior which um, I would like to think we would see routinely on our campus. Um, Harvard stands for veritas. We stand for truth. Uh, truth is something which needs to be revealed. It needs to be discovered. And it can only be done so if we are each willing to be generous listeners, if we're each willing to probe and understand not just what we believe in, but to test our beliefs against those of others, uh, to examine evidence, um, to engage with people and to be vulnerable. Um, we need to be willing to be proven wrong if we have a true commitment to the truth because nobody has a monopoly um, on truth, on virtue. We can all learn from each other. And that is um, what these conversations um, are all about. I think they're occurring at a time where this commitment to truth, this commitment to veritas, this commitment to civil discourse has never been more important, both for us, but also for this nation. And so um, I'm delighted um, that we are gonna start this series of conversations um, by welcoming back to Harvard um, a celebrated graduate of both the college um, and the law school, and a person that I've admired for many years, um, that I've voted for multiple times, but also somebody who I've um, come to consider um, a friend. Um, five years have passed uh, since Deval Patrick received an honorary degree um, and served as our commencement speaker. And his call to action um, today rings out as loudly and as clearly as it did on that beautiful day. And I would, I would like to quote him if I may. I don't want unrest in the streets, he said, but I do want unrest in our hearts and minds. I do want us all to be uneasy about the grim realities of black men and families and the widespread spread nonchalance about poverty. I want us to be uneasy about the chronic desperation of communities. Some of us are just one genera generation away from living in 
about the way we dehumanize the fellow souls we call alien, about the carelessness with which we treat the planet itself. We have many reasons to be uneasy. I hope today's conversation helps us determine how to use our restlessness to, to produce productive change, productive conversation with each other, to celebrate the values on which this institution was founded, um, to help build a stronger community, and indeed to model the behavior that we would hope to see um, in the rest of the nation. It, Gives me great pleasure to both welcome Deval Patrick um, back to our campus uh, to this conversation, and I want to I want to thank uh, Kerry Johnson, who I know is going to um, begin this conversation with the governor um, to push him a little bit um, on these issues, Kerry, uh, but I know to to help get us off to a very very good start. So, um, Kerry, over to you, and thank you very much for your leadership um, today. Thank you so much, President. And thank you so much, Governor Patrick, for making time today. Thank you know, you. it's kind of- well, Thanks to Larry for the very warm welcome. It's very kind. Governor, we're talking at a time when millions of people are suffering, right? They're suffering from the coronavirus pandemic, from lost jobs, lost income. It's happening while people are still in the streets protesting for racial justice as, as they have been for months in big cities and small towns all over this country and in the middle of a very polarizing election season where over 60 million people have already voted. A lot of people are angry and afraid right now. And so I was hoping to take you back to a challenging time in your tenure as governor, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, a really a week of crisis. Uh, people died in the explosions, a law enforcement officer died later that week. There was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear in the state at that time. I'm wondering, as the leader of, of, this, of the Commonwealth, how do you communicate facts, what's known and what's not known in that kind of crisis climate? We'll start with an easy question, I guess, I huh, Gary? <laughs> I mean, look, I, I think, um, first of all, thank you for having me. And let me just uh, acknowledge at the outset that um, I don't have all the answers. I'm, I am, I think like a lot of people in America grappling for uh, answers and grappling um, through those answers to find a bridge back to each other. Um, I think there's something very exciting about this moment, which is that um, all the hardship, all of the suffering exposed by the pandemic um, means we have an opportunity to confront uh, so much of our unfinished business. And I think being um, aware of how easily we can be divided, and I hope we come back to that, um, is, uh, it was part of how I thought about um, and tried to make decisions around the marathon bombing. So today, when we look back, Carrie, you know, everyone thinks, well, there were two guys, two bombs, um, and um, uh, you know, and that was all, you know, sorted um, in the way uh, in the ways that it was sorted at the time. When I first heard about uh, the bombing, um, you know, on a when I was on my way home that afternoon, a wonderful, uh, unusually open uh, calendar for me that day, in an unseasonably warm, gorgeous day. Remember, we just knew that there had been two explosions. We didn't know how many people were involved. We didn't know whether that was whether it was over. Um, you know how widespread this uh, uh, this would, would be. In fact, there was some hope early on that they were um, at best, you know, gasoline line explosions or something like that under manhole covers. Uh, and it was. Um, and we got the you know questions of, uh, of speculation right from the beginning. You know, in the first in the first press avail, someone said, "You know, is, was this thing really staged by the government?" And you know, something like that, some crazy uh, uh, stuff. We had um, every available resource at the federal, state, and local uh, lever level. We had um, uh, tremendous interest in information, and not always a lot of information uh, to offer. But we tried to communicate often and to acknowledge um, uh, each question, 
to take our time in answering uh, questions and to tell people what we could tell them and to tell and to, and to stop short of what we couldn't, particularly as we were um, investigating the, uh, uh, you know, while the investigation was active. But I think the, um, apart from the, you know, the hard headed stuff of, you know, how many injuries, how many deaths, who was being treated where, how many uh, law enforcement uh, or recovery resources we had on, on deck, how to reconnect runners with their families and their friends, uh, because remember the race was suspended when the, when the bombs went off, and how generally to get order um, in a time when we didn't know, as I said, whether we were through it, whether it was over. I got a great piece of advice, which I will never forget from um, my chief of staff at the time who said, acknowledge and call up the, the acts of kindness that regular people are showing to others. Um, and I did that. I talked about how there were folks bringing runners in, you know, they lived on or near the route, they were bringing runners in who were confused and exhausted and dehydrated and, uh, and warming them up and giving them something to drink and helping them uh, understand the news and ultimately connect with their, uh, with their families and their belongings. Um, just that there were lots and lots of acts of kindness we were finding out about from people. And as we acknowledged them, we found out about more. It was as if they, you know, talking about that begat other um, uh, genuine acts of grace. And I think that that business of asking people to turn to each other rather than on each other turns out to have been um, both a part of the, contributed to the speed of our recovery, but also uh, to our coming out stronger on the other end. Governor, to that critical point of getting people to turn to each other instead of on each other, you know better than I that within a matter of hours, all of these random people started going on the internet, playing detective. There were lots of rumors. People were identified as suspects who were not suspects. These were people of Middle Eastern origin, um, people of different ethnicities. And there was a real sense of fear and people acting out of fear and emotion. How do you tamp that down? Because I, I see some of that in the climate that we're living in today. Well, one thing is to be aware of it. You know, the the. I can tell you, look, as a black man, I am very self-conscious of how easy it is for people uh, to presume all manner of uh, ill intent uh, or uh, bad behavior on me without knowing anything else about me. It's just how it is or how it has been uh, and often uh, remains. Uh, so, you know, being, when we first began to understand that, um, that the, uh, that the perpetrators were of Middle Eastern um, descent, and that was beginning to uh, to leak. I would tell you, even before that, people presumed that um, uh, this certainly looked and felt like a terrorist attack, and an awful lot of people at that time associated terrorists with a certain, you know, ethnic background. Forget about the amount of, uh, you know, white nationalist ter terrorists. It's not the thing that was in people's mind. The image that was in um, uh, people's minds. And so there were, um, there were ways I was trying to get across, you know, let's not jump to those conclusions. They're frankly not helpful. Um, so, you know, you saw, we, um, the marathon is often described as, the, as uh, the nation's largest block party. It's just a great big, you know, and we're not famously warm and friendly. Um, in, uh, in New England all the time, but um, there is a kind of a cheerful, openness at that, uh, at that occasion. And many, many of the runners come from other parts uh, of the country and the world. It's a very, very diverse field. So the fact that, um, you know, lots of uh, folks in these, um, in these white or overwhelmingly white cities and towns along the, along the route were going out and bringing in these runners from far away places who look different uh, and in some cases spoke different languages and did that because what they saw and what they connected with was their humanity and not their appearance, not their, um, not what, uh, um, not what they looked like, I think was a, it was a part of the message without, you know, saying so in so many words. What do you think the unfinished business is from, from that 
moment. Is there? Do you feel like? Do you feel like uh, there were things you would have done differently about that week? Well, you know, when I look back on it, I think all things considered, we had a pretty good week. We had a, um, I mean, that it was a week was a marvel, right? I mean, we that 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 crime wasn't solved by law enforcement alone, it was solved by a whole community. Um, it was their turning in their, their pictures and their videos and all that stuff. I mean, I, that, that movie that was made of it doesn't begin to capture how the, um, you know, these two terrorist needles in a haystack um, were found. There was information we had as we got close to closing in on the, on the suspects that the network uh, that there was an activity beyond um, uh, Boston. In fact, I sent a SWAT team to um, down to the South Coast um, to search a uh, one of our University of Massachusetts campuses. I ordered the Amtrak train stopped and searched on its way to New York outside of uh, New Haven because we had information that someone fitting a description of one of the suspects had gotten on the first train uh, to New York. There was a, there were a lot of other pieces. Not all of that was known to the public. But the public did contribute to the um, to helping us identify and find uh, the two uh, perpetrators in a, what was it a hundred hours, and and so and here is maybe a, a small example, but I think a meaningful one in Watertown when everyone um, you know we'd finally found the surviving uh, uh, suspect. And there was more heat out there. I mean, every law enforcement, um, uh, you know, this was Watertown jurisdiction, but we had federal and local um, and state uh, law enforcement, everybody armed to the teeth and emotions running really high. So something could easily go wrong. And, um, and in fact, I remember um, being in the, uh, in the command center when the, um, when the FBI agent in control was telling officers to stand, they had open fire on this on this boat and telling them to, to stand down. When the suspect was brought out on a gurney, and as I say, all these heavily armed um, uh, cops from various levels really wound up, there wasn't a single word that was out of line, not a, you know, not a slur, not a not a gesture that was inappropriate. Everybody was totally professional, and it was it was inspiring, you know. I, and I think about that particularly now when we're doing so much hard work confronting uh, behaviors in uh, among police departments that uh, uh, that um, you know have uh, have displayed uh, excessive force um, in a lot of communities for too long. You know, Governor, we're here today launching a series of conversations about difficult issues on which there can be disagreement. And so I hope you could talk us through your thinking on this issue. I think early in your legal career, you did a lot of work um, fighting the death penalty, right? Now, one of the, the surviving defendant in the marathon case um, was tried, convicted, and received the death penalty. Um, that's up on, uh, it's uncertain now legally, but can you talk through how you lead um, when, um, when you may have a personal opposition to something like capital punishment in that circumstance? Well, look, I, before I knew much about the death penalty, um, I, I mean, I guess I supported the death penalty. I don't think I thought very much about it, but I, I supported it. And then I got my dream job, um, on the staff of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund after I finished my clerkship. And, um, uh, and the only uh, position they, they had was on the uh, death penalty defense team. And it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I really wanted to do voting rights. And uh, as one of the staff attorneys said, um, look, we don't hire very often, just get here. And you, know, you can expand from there. And I came and I started to have my, um, first experiences actually dealing with the cases, actually dealing with uh, the individuals. 
And I can tell you one of my first cases involved a, uh, an individual in Alabama who had been convicted of, uh, I think, two murders in the same uh, uh, in the same uh, you know sort of enterprise. And um, we got the cases because this was the stage at which they came to us um, at the very end, after all the state appeals had been run, uh, after the conviction had gone up to the Alabama Supreme Court and been affirmed, the conviction and the sentence. Um, and then there was habeas corpus and they were within days of, uh, of uh, an execution date. And I remember, um, you know, we got on the phone with the, uh, with the federal judge um, in, uh, in Montgomery, I think it was, and he was willing to hear uh, my uh, request for a stay of the execution on the phone because I couldn't get to Montgomery in time for the execution date. Uh, and I remember he said, uh, all right, he said, who's, who's representing the petitioner, which was my guy. And I said, Deval Patrick here from the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund. And he said, all right. He said, who's representing the state? And the uh, attorney general came on, uh, his name was Ed Carnes. He said, hey, Ed, how's your family? And I thought, OK, I'm done. <laughs> and, uh, and he started off by saying, you know, look, Mr. Patrick, don't you just think there's some people who ought to die? And I said, you know, in fact, I agree with you. In fact, we're all going to die one day. But the, that's not the question. The question is, was his trial fair? He gave us a stay. And uh, Ed Carnes, who's now a judge, actually, um, had, you know, he, he approached the case honorably. We got access to the prosecutor's file and in that file discovered a sworn statement by the only eyewitness positively identifying someone else as the killer. And it had either been disclosed to defense counsel and he hadn't done anything about it, or it hadn't been disclosed to uh, defense counsel. Either way, it was a constitutional violation. He, this, my client had had his head shaved and all the stuff they do right before you go in to be uh, electrocuted. They take, they shave your head because it catches on fire otherwise. Um, and I saw that system up close. Now, I got to the Justice Department years later as head of the Civil Rights Division. Minutes before I got there, the, um, in, uh, in 94, I think it was 95, the crime bill had been passed. We hear a lot about it now um, uh, during the presidential race, but uh, President Clinton had uh, uh, gotten the crime bill passed and it had reinstated the federal death penalty. And as a part of the protocols within the department, no death penalty could go forward unless approved by the attorney general herself and cleared by the head of the civil rights division for process. So I had to look at those cases again. That was my job, knowing that I opposed the, um, the death penalty. And it's, and frankly, when, uh, when, the, um, when the marathon bomber was convicted and sentenced, he should have been convicted, he should have been uh, uh, sentenced. Um, and I still think the death penalty is wrong. Um, I respect that we have the system we have, um, but I'd rather see him uh, die in prison frankly. So how do you, it's a long way around to your, your, um, your question, but you, it's been more than one. I've never taken a job where I've left my conscience at the door. Um, but, um, you know, part of my work has been understanding how to respect those parts of the system that are arrived at justly. And, um, in the case of the death penalty, that has been arrived at at the federal level through a democratic um, process, and it needs to be changed through a democratic process. Thank you, Governor. We have a number of students who have are itching to ask you very important questions. I'll try to be briefer in my <laughs> Not at all. Uh, we're going to bring them in now one by one. The first is Jessica Murphy. She's a Nebraskan and a second year student at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine and a first delegate for Harvard Student Dental Association. All right. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Governor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. 
Uh, my question is, myself and many of my colleagues have been very concerned with the politicizing of science in recent times, and with the offices of the FDA becoming more and more politicized, how can we trust the process of verifying the efficacy and the safety of a COVID vaccine produced from this administration? And additionally, how can we ensure that the American people understand the importance of both vaccination and herd immunity, especially at a time when healthcare professionals are being challenged by the disinformation campaigns coming from uh, those who are opposed to vaccines. Sorry, yeah, kind of it, yeah that, it, but one question per customer. There's a lot in that. Um, so I, I've worried about this too. It, of all the things to be um, politicized, Jessica, I never would have imagined that a public health emergency would be one of them, never. Um, so to the point where you know whether you do or you don't wear a mask is a, is a marker of something. Um, to me, what it's a marker of is uh, not wearing a mask is a marker of selfishness um, and nothing else. I think that the FDA um, has to be rigorous, not, and that's not the same thing as slow, but it has to be rigorous, it has to be careful, and it has to be as transparent as they can be. We, I, um, sit on the board of a company that developed a therapy um, in response to sickle cell disease, which is a disease that uh, primarily affects uh, African-Americans or people of African uh, descent. And we got expedited um, consideration, but the science was solid. We got tested, we got pushed back. Um, and uh, they sped up the process because it was um, uh, a, uh, uh, it, it's a, it's a, um, uh, a disorder uh, where there are not many um, solutions. And I think uh, what I saw there and I've seen elsewhere is that the FDA is capable of respecting the science and also being fast. Uh, so, but they're gonna have to tell us, right? We knew, they talked to us through that process of, uh, of approving the, um, the sickle cell uh, uh, therapy. They, we were back and forth on questions about the science and the uh, and the clinical trials uh, defending uh, the science, and I think the FDA is going to have to do that here. Um, beyond that, you know, we, we I guess I, you know, I, I I said earlier I I just don't understand how you make a political statement uh, or you use a public health emergency to divide us. What, uh, back to what Carrie was asking me about my experience with the marathon bombing, there was a real opportunity to unite in that. And in that unity, we got better outcomes. I think the same is true uh, here. I'm, I'm co-authoring an op-ed with some really great, uh, with a guy named Dirk Kempthorne, who was the uh, governor of Idaho, I believe. Um, but a Republican, and uh, uh, we are co-chairing something called the COVID Collaborative, and we did some uh, polling on uh, Americans' expectations uh, around a vaccine and the, uh, the development of it, the distribution of it, and the use of it, and, and the polling was very encouraging. Folks want uh, scientific rigor uh, alongside speed in developing the, the vaccine. They want a fair and just distribution system um, where uh, frontline workers, folks who deal with, um, with children and so forth are, are the first to have access to it. Uh, and they will use it. Um, some 80% um, are confident that they, uh, that they will use it, although they wanna make sure it's safe before they, uh, before they do. So some of it will be modeling that behavior, I think, in our, from our leaders. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Our next questioner is Alika Masse, a higher education master's student at the Graduate School of Education and also an intern for the Office of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. It's all yours. Hi, Alika. Hi, thank you, Governor Patrick, for your time and insight today. My question pertains to voter engagement. Politicians typically appeal to an older audience resulting with little surprise and significantly less voter turnout among young people, approximately ages 29 years old and under. In your experience, how have you engaged with millennial and Generation Z populations to encourage voting? 
As an extension, what are your thoughts about current efforts by the presidential candidates to engage young voters? For example, through incorporating political social movements and promoting diversity, or having strong messages of patriotism in their campaigns. Do you think it's true really that uh, politicians generally court uh, older voters? I talked to everybody. I remember the first time, maybe it's because I didn't know any better, but the first time I ran, uh, I remember spending a tremendous amount of time in schools and partly because you know nobody knew who I was and, um, and those may have been the only invitations I could get you couldn't really be partisan legal. You could talk about um, you could talk about civic and political life and what elections were about. And I and, and mind you, when I say schools, I'm talking about you know middle schools and uh, and high schools. And I remember um, my campaign manager saying, "You you do realize that none of those people are old enough to vote. You should be spending so much time." Um, little did we realize that an awful lot of people came to the campaign through their through their kids. Because their kids would come and volunteer on the uh, on the weekends or after school, and because we had made a pledge to them and ourselves to keep the campaign positive throughout, no matter what, it was a place where their uh, where their moms and dads felt, you know, was a constructive place to be, and the uh, and the spirit was high. So from my perspective, it was young people who got me elected and kept me in office. We created a governor's youth council when I was in office so that we would be sure to have younger perspective on actual policy. And in fact, that we were thinking about which policies to, to focus on um, uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, young people. In other words, not just asking young people what they thought of what we intended to do already, but to get their uh, insights on the things we should uh, focus on. And don't get me wrong, we didn't get everything right but I was never of the view. And, and I don't really see successful current um, politicians, at least not on a statewide or national level, whose focus is just on, uh, on older voters. I certainly hope not. I think um, to your point about, uh, your question about uh, social movements, you know, to the extent they are led by young people, Black Lives Matter or uh, some of the efforts around, uh, around uh, climate change awareness and action, um, some of the efforts around uh, poverty, um, you know, sort of things that uh, Reverend Barber is doing with the Poor People's Campaign. Um, in many respects, our current politics is led by young people. Um, and that's not a bad thing at all. I've always, you know, all, I, I was taught by my grandparents, I think most of us were, that we're supposed to do what we can in our time to leave things better for those who come behind us. That generational responsibility, um, I've, I believe very much in, and there are a lot of people, my kids included, who feel that our generation, generations before, have not borne our generational responsibility. And that's why, um, the, uh, uh, there is the kind of urgency um, there is. And I think that's a great thing. Can I say just one last tiny thing? A wonderful comment I heard um, from a, uh, a student at Morehouse uh, or graduate of Morehouse the other day who told me that uh, John Lewis uh, and, uh, and Andy Young came to campus when he was a student and said to them, um, as students, you are supposed to be radical. You are supposed to be radical. That is, I can tell you, not the message we got at Harvard necessarily, um, a place I love, but I think there is a lot to like about that idea because you know, having that energy to push us forward um, is a really, really good thing, I think. It's one of the reasons I feel really hopeful today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next questioner is Lara Roach. She's a fifth year PhD candidate in the biological and biomedical sciences program and a diversity and inclusion fellow for the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. It's all yeah. yours. Hi, Governor Patrick. Uh, my question is, as a scientist, it has been incredibly disheartening to see the current administration dismantle the public's trust in science. 
They have questioned scientific experts, spread false information, and failed to be transparent about climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. In your opinion, how should leaders balance transparency, credibility, and public safety? And how can future leadership restore the public's trust in science? Thank you. Wow. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I mean, it seems it, it, it seems like one shouldn't have to say that transparency is a good thing. Um, but let me say, I think transparency is a good thing. I also understand that um, that there is a um, there is a right time and sometimes a wrong time for how much transparency. That sounds like a uh, like I'm trying to dodge um, uh, something, but you can imagine how. Let me put it this way: I heard um, Vice President Pence say in um, uh, in the debate in the vice presidential debate that. Uh, their strategy, if you will, was to give the public to trust the American people with uh, with information. And I believe actually the American people can be trusted with information. I don't think that they did, but uh, and I think that President Trump is on record not having done so. I think it was um, it's understandable if you don't want the responsibility for things that go sideways, if you don't give all the information uh, to people, or if you say simply to governors, you take care of it and we'll be here um, to, uh, but you know, if governors do, I mean, to me, that always seemed like, uh, you know, imagine if, if we'd had the attack on Pearl Harbor and the response from the White House had been uh, to the governor of, uh, of Hawaii, um, you know, I hope good luck with the fire and give us a call if you need some, need some help. There are certain things that are of national interest uh, and required national coordination doesn't mean that the, all of the decisions have to be made by the president or by the president's team. But the consistency of guidelines and the seriousness about those guidelines, I'm not talking about enforcement, I'm talking about just the seriousness with which the tone that's set and the, uh, uh, and the response um, uh, and, and, and treating the, the, the scientific fact um, with the gravity it deserves um, is an important leadership factor. Avoiding panic is not accomplished by giving people a fraction of the, uh, of the facts, in my view. It's giving some perspective to those facts and it's modeling calm. Right, I mean, it's like I said, it, it's a it's a much smaller um, uh, analog. But when the bombs went off at the marathon, we didn't know at the first press conference whether there were more bombers and more bombs. We didn't know. On the day we arrested um, the final suspect, that morning, um, we knew we had uh, um, we had chased him into into Watertown, um, but at that same time, that early that morning, there was a fellow matching the description of one of the uh, assailants being pursued by federal officers over by the courthouse. The Kennedy Library was on fire and someone matching uh, uh, a relevant description had been stopped in the Fenway in a taxi um, with explosive devices identified in the trunk of the, of the taxi. That's the reason I asked the whole area to shelter in place. Now, I didn't tell everybody all that because we didn't know enough to tell. Well, somebody's being chased. That sounds like a, you know, a premature news bulletin. That's not a fact, right? So, um, but that, I, just to give you some, I had to make a decision. I had to tell everybody about the decision, but not all that went into that um, uh, decision at the, uh, at the moment. So I, I don't think these are these are always um, simple decisions by any means, um, sim uh, simple conclusions. But I think that erring on the side of information and conveying calm um, is a re are two important um, qualities. I think at a time of crisis, um, in that we look for in any leader. Does that help? Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Our last question comes from Xavier Dumain, a six year PhD candidate in biological and biomedical sciences and a diversity and inclusion fellow in the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Take it away. Xavier. Hi, Governor Patrick. Thank you so much for just taking the time to be here and engage with our community. Um, so my questions actually focus on racial justice. So as a black graduate student, it's been really empowering to see racial justice come into the forefront of our nation's attention. And as a result, Harvard's attention. And seeing that this is such a unique time in our nation's history to engage in honest conversations and meaningful action around racial justice from many different perspectives, I think it's important that we get it right. So amidst all these conversations and approaches to this issue, I would like to know, given your career, as well as your personal life experiences, what do you feel like is being left out of the conversation? Or what do you think is not receiving enough of our attention and action? And I'm going to sneak in a second question here. Uh, whatever that is for you, how do you suggest that leaders at Harvard, from student leaders to the deans of the schools to the university leadership, go about engaging in that in our community? I'm glad that these issues are out in the open. I, I'm heartbroken that it took, you know, a videotaped lynching for people to finally accept that, yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yes, that actually happened. Um, I'm glad that folks are offering their testimonials um, about, uh, you know, far less um, devastating uh, or, or, or violent, um, but just as devastating, you know, indignities du jour. And I have been um, excited, I, I, holding my breath at the beginning, frankly, because um, I knew that uh, if the protests turned violent, that would be the story and not the underlying anguish and I've been I've been uh, more than relieved. I've been excited that they have been overwhelmingly peaceful and they've been sustained given our um, famously short attention span um, in this country. I think that they you know you will know Xavier what I mean when I say that um, as a as a as a black man you, you know in um, there's a tremendous amount, as a black person, there's a tremendous amount of work you have to do to put other people at ease before you can talk about um, race in honest terms. And, um, and I think that the readiness to talk, to have uncomfortable conversations is higher than it has been at almost any time in my life um, across differences. That's a really good thing. Um, turning those, uh, experiences and those feelings and that history into, um, into action um, will come, I think, and is beginning to come in, or may come, let me put it that way, uh, at the level of policy. And I think that's enormously important. Um, but I think until we make it personal, um, that's, you know, all we'll get is, um, is Band-Aids. I mean, I, all the conversation about reparations, for example, to me, reparations doesn't mean a thing without reconciliation. Um, there's a level of understanding, there's a level of experience um, we haven't reached yet, and that I'm hopeful we will. And I'll give you just a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and when I came on scholarship to Milton Academy, um, that for me was like landing on a different planet. And I found that um, my new friends at Milton Academy were interested, but so much in my life on the South Side of Chicago. On the South Side of Chicago, they were interested, but so much in my life at Milton to the point where I felt at 14 years old, like I had to straddle these two different worlds where the price of admission to one was rejecting the other. And you know, I learned a valuable lesson, personal lesson about the importance of deciding who I was and being that all the time. Um, but it does break, that kind of thing breaks a lot of people's hearts um, and, uh, and breaks a lot of people. 
And I think we're gonna have to figure out how to actually live integrated lives. That's not the same thing as integration policies or, uh, you know, we sent the kids in to integrate the schools because the adults wouldn't integrate the neighborhoods. And now we're re-segregating the schools and nobody even blinks. We are, um, you know, we've had uh, conversations for years about um, how to make campuses and workplaces truly um, uh, integrated. And every single time um, there is a new resolution to move forward and actually create a model of what a polyglot nation uh, looks like, there is always backlash and challenge. And it always is made to sound reasoned and detached and arm's length <clears throat> when in fact what it's detached from is the reality that we are becoming in America. The hopeful thing I think comes from my sense, uh, for me, comes from my sense of the genius of our founding, which is that the, the mechanisms for reinventing ourselves were built in from the beginning. And every once in a while, America does reinvent herself. And this may be one such moment. And how beautiful to think that the reinvention this time could be led by the very outcasts and despised. Um, and I think that's a redemptive kind of um, uh, idea. Between now and then, where we are and where we want to be will be a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And it means, I think, we're going to have to internalize something um, that is a little like what Louis Pasteur talked about when he described what it means to be educated when he wrote uh, that being educated is learning to listen to anything without losing your temper or your self-confidence. And so that notion of listening with an open mind and heart, um, of um, learning how to hear hard things, and I'm not just talking about black people talking to white people and white people having to learn how to hear hard things, but black people um, also um, having to hear hard things, having to wade through this, this um, you know, tendency we have to talk about relative suffering. Well, you think you had it bad, my people had it uh, bad in those ways. I, none of that gets us very far. I think it's about trying to really understand people's lived experience, the limitations on their freedom and possibility that come from things completely outside their control and to ask ourselves whether that is consistent with the civic ideals we aspire to in this country. I think the answer to that is no. And so we should be intentional and personal about trying to surmount it. What are we not talking about? I think almost everything we're talking about is, um, is on the table, except really what it means to integrate neighborhoods. And um, I think that's hard. Um, uh, and I don't have an answer uh, uh, to that, but I hope uh, I hope folks will give me some thought to that. Thank you so much. Governor Patrick, thank you so much for, for generously sharing your time and your thoughts. You've given us all a lot to think about. Thank you, Carrie. I wish I had uh, I wish I had better ideas, but I love this community and I and uh, and this university. I wish for its continued uh, flourishing. Um, and I am counting on Harvard at the end of the day, being that place where people can listen to anything without losing their temper or their self-confidence um, and showing us how to you know, find a bridge back to each other. Thank you, sir. Thank you, take care. We're now gonna start uh, the second panel um, with a number of Harvard faculty and student leaders. I'm delighted to, uh, to have with us uh, Arkan Fung from Harvard Kennedy School, Sadal Neely from Harvard Business School, uh, Greg Mankiw, a professor of economics, and Shahara Jackson, a graduate student in the education school and a student leader here on campus. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being with us. Nice to be with you. Uh, Professor Mankiw, I wanted to start with you uh, because you run 
a very interesting freshman seminar that's devoted in part to some of the project we've been talking about today. Can you explain how you go about selecting people for the seminar and what your goal is in putting this mix together? Sure, I run a freshman seminar called The Economist of the World, and it's a course that students would take roughly concurrently with learning the basic economics. So it's not really economic theory, it's really talking about economic policy. And that I only have 12 students in it, but I'm always oversubscribed. I usually have about 100 applicants for, for, the, um, uh, for the 12 slots, and they give me a lot wide discretion how to choose them. So one of the things I do is I ask the applicants, on issues of economic policy, do you tend to lean to the right? More limited, do you believe in more limited government or do you tend to lean to the left, more activist government? Um, and I look for students that, are, that are, I look for a class to be balanced. So, so, so six on the left, six on the right, because I want them to get together and talk to each other and recognize why they have these differences. So we read, we read a bunch of books, some from more conservative economists, some from more liberal, and we debate them. It's like a, really a book club. And I think throughout that process, they become close friends because this question are looking for friends. It's, I usually taught this in the fall, this year I'm doing in the spring, but you know, they're looking for new friends. They just showed up at college and they now they're developing friends with people with different points of view. And uh, the discussions are always lively. Um, my job is just to moderate. Uh, and I think they leave being able to understand points of view that they disagree with. My, my, my favorite comment is from this course, by the way, was a, I had a very liberal student from Santa Monica named Joe. And Joe at the end of the course said his favorite book we read in the course was Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. Milton Friedman's a you know, famous right of center, maybe libertarian might be the right word, economist. And I said, Joe, why do you like Milton Friedman's book so much? And he said, well, this is the point of view I have to figure out how to argue against. Uh, and I love that because he basically appreciated the clarity of the arguments and he had to figure out how to respond to them. He had to internalize the arguments enough to respond thoughtfully. And I thought that was just a perfect uh, comment. Professor Neely, I want to turn to you for a moment. Um, you use certain methods in your courses to try to generate discussion and productive disagreement. How does that work? How do you keep it productive instead of turning less productive in there? Perry, thank you so much for having me uh, today. So Harvard Business School is built on the notion that uh, having intellectual debate, intellectual discourse, is the means of learning. And this intellectual discourse is really about debates, arguments, trying to look at every possible perspective of a particular issue of sorts. So we're diagnosing uh, a, a, an organization issue and we're coming up with action plans. And along the way, students have to uh, hold and argue different positions. So. We teach our students from early on, from the time they show up to campus, it's a two-year business uh, school, uh, that we debate and we have discussions and that's how we learn. The first month, uh, students are very respectfully, kindly, lovingly disagreeing with their um, classmates. I mean, they will just, they'll use those words. I kindly, respectfully, I just, I disagree just a little bit. By the end of the semester, it's more like I completely wholeheartedly, fully with my whole being disagree with that point of view. And why is that important? Disagreeing with someone and having these difficult conversation is a practiced skill. It's a practice skill and we teach our students what those skills are uh, throughout the semester. For example, don't attack the person challenge the argument. And that's a uh, reframing for many students. Another thing is, instead of defending and protecting yourself uh, in, a, in the middle of a debate, try to learn and see the other's point of view. So get into inquiry mode rather than advocacy mode. And this idea of strong opinions loosely held. Uh, so that learning can take place. And we spend a lot of time across classes having this type of conversation with students. And, and I'll say this, when it comes to the topics that seem too sensitive or intractable, uh, where people just have very polarized views, we actually invite students to, 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 to um, 
to talk about those things and not shy away from them. Because the instinct for many of our students is to avoid those. What if I say the wrong thing in a conversation about race and I'm deemed racist? What if I say the wrong thing in a conversation about gender and I am deemed X? What if I say the wrong thing? So students are constantly worried about those things. So we ensure, and I say uh, to our students, I say, Let's have this conversation with a spirit of learning and understanding and forgiveness while we're all trying to augment our ability to understand one another. And that really helps. Thank you. I want to turn to Shahara Jackson. You've spent a lot of times in classrooms. You're currently a graduate student. I think you were a principal before, before in your earlier career. You've been talking a little bit about people learning how to sit with discomfort, sit with discomfort in conversations. And I, I wonder if you could explore that a little further and also talk about when it is in fact time to draw a line. Maybe there are moments when you, you need to draw a line in a, a certain kind of conversation. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here and um, I think that sitting in discomfort means having the ability, uh, as Governor Patrick said, to hear uh, a differing opinion and not critique the person uh, for what they're feeling or, or, or what their expression is. Um, and I liken it to the Baldwin quote where as long as <laughs> you know, your disagreement is not rooted uh, in the disrespectfulness of my humanity. I just messed that quote up, but um, <laughs> as long as it is not uh, disrespecting me as a human being, I'm totally fine with that. Um, I'm able to listen um, and potentially not accept what you are saying, um, but having the ability to uh, think deeply and, and use curiosity uh, to find out why you are taking that particular position. Oftentimes, uh, our opinions are based on our own experiences. And so uh, sitting with discomfort means that you're gonna have to experience loss. Um, I think of my time in Ron Heifetz's class, um, where we had a pretty contentious debate one day where he said to me at some point, you lack curiosity and I, I was frustrated with him, but uh, he came to me after class and said, uh, he was in a debate with a, another white male. And I said, you all are being selfish here, taking up uh, the class's time arguing with one another. And um, he acknowledged that as a black woman to see two white men arguing in class, uh, taking up our instructional time was something that potentially frustrated me because we see that play out all across our world where you know, men of power typically are white and uh, disregard those who are casualties of their disagreements, right? So there's an African proverb that says when the elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And so, um, I felt like I was sitting in class suffering as a result of the two elephants fighting. I want to turn to Professor Arkan Fung from the Kennedy School. You study democracy, quite a hell of a thing to be studying these days. Um, we, started, we started this conversation talking about uh, protests for racial justice, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the very contentious election we're in. Sometimes, Professor, it feels like uh, people are not listening to each other uh, in the streets or in the classrooms. I wonder if you see some cause for hope in recent history or in the scholarship that you're doing. Um, how do you assess the situation? Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, I think it's really hard right now. We are on the eve of the most significant election, certainly of my lifetime, and I, uh, many, many Americans feel this way. And it feels when so much is at stake and the differences seem so large, 
it uh, is hard to think about the practices and what we can do to have conversations and really reach some understanding across these vast gulfs of difference that people have been talking about. So I have found it useful to look at other models. And let me just mention one, which comes from also a, a huge gulf. And this example comes from uh, women who led the pro-life and pro-choice movements in Boston, right? That's a big, big gulf. And um, they actually had a dialogue with each other to try to find common ground in the 1990s. And this was in the wake of a shooting of this, this fellow, John Salvi, shot up to abortion clinics, uh, two clinics that performed abortions in Boston and, and killed several people and wounded others. And both uh, leaders of the pro-life and pro-choice movements really, that was a wake up call for them. And they said, yeah, we disagree a lot, but this is just not what we had in mind. So the leaders actually met in secret for several years to try to figure out whether they could come to any sort of mutual understanding and common ground. And they had to meet in secret because their constituents would have really been quite angry with them if they had learned that their leadership was talking to the other side. And they jointly published quite a beautiful uh, opinion piece in the Boston, Rev in, uh, the Boston Globe in the early 2000s called Talking with the Enemy. And one of the things is after these long, like years long conversations, they found out they actually disagreed with each other more deeply than they had even thought at the beginning. <laughs> but they really have fundamentally different views of the world they learned, but they could find some common ground. And they decided that in public, like uh, Sadal said, they uh, would not criticize each other, that they would stick to the issues. They would try to turn the temperature down. They would treat each other with some respect, even though they disagreed uh, deeply on, measure, on, on issues of principle and, and of course on policy. And um, the, the opinion piece had one section that was drafted by the pro-life contingent and another that was um, uh, uh, written by the pro-choice contingent. And one of the things I found really, um, really interesting in the pro-life uh, expression, they said one of the things we really learned was to see the inherent goodness of these pro-choice women. And they, it's contradictory, right? Because they didn't think their position was good. They thought it was deeply immoral. And they said, well, this is, this is like the mystery of love. It's just really hard to understand, right? And I think it's in a mo we're in a moment, and it's going to be a while, I think, before many of us can get there, where we try to embrace that mystery of love, where we see the inherent goodness in our opponents, even when we disagree so deeply with them. And so I wanted to, uh, to answer just like, I'm approaching this current problem of civic dialogue from uh, the other end of the spectrum. Like why would someone who thinks that their opponent is so wrong on every single issue, maybe even seeks to dehumanize them, maybe seeks to destroy them. Why would you wanna have civic dialogue with that person as these women in the pro-life and pro-choice movements did? And I think one reason is they realize that at the end of the day, they have to live together. And in this context, in the greater Boston area, they have to live together. And I think it's an open question now whether many Americans, those living in urban areas and those living in rural areas, really do accept the proposition that the, at the end of the day, we have to live together in one society. And uh, unless we get there, I think it's gonna be hard to motivate people to engage in civic dialogue. On campus, it's easier. It's pretty clear that we have to live together at least for four years or two years on one campus. So the motivation is higher. Um, and for these women, I think of the pro-life and pro-choice movements, there was an internal reason too, is that treating your, even your opponent, your enemy with respect and dignity is part of your own integrity and moral code. And they had to figure out a way to get there. And I was trying to think about that mystery of love in my own life with my op opponents in a, in a way. And, um, you know, the one example that I, I came to, which uh, is, goes way back to when I was in high school, I, was, I grew up in Oklahoma in high school, uh, where I went to high school as one of maybe two or three Asian kids. And uh, a lot of people on this call, probably on this panel, have much more recent experiences of explicit racism. Um, but 
uh, at, at that point, you know, it was Oklahoma in the 80s. And, you know, there was some pretty explicit racism. People used the C epithet for Asian people. And I, I think in that moment, for whatever reason, I didn't um, react with total anger and shutting down. I did try to understand why a person would say that to me in um, such an angry way and tried to I think see the goodness in that person, even though they were doing this kind of horrible thing. And I guess I try to remember back to that moment and try to be that person when I encounter people who have positions and advocate for things and take actions that I regard as reprehensible to try to find some understanding and some goodness and, and try to dig deeply for that. Professor Neely, I saw you uh, reacting a little bit earlier. What was on your mind just then? Well, the idea that we, 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 we're ex we exist in a pluralistic world, in a pluralistic society, um, and in the absence of finding ways to achieve common ground uh, and finding ways to diminish ourselves a little bit long enough to hear other people, to hear other truth, and believe that two ideas can coexist. If I believe one thing, does it mean that um, it's a threat or an attack uh, on another person's beliefs? Uh, so this idea of and instead of or, and ideas coexisting, perspectives coexisting, and making room for all of those things, I think are crucial. Uh, and I understand this idea of how do I find ways to love people and to give them room, even if I think they don't love me, is I think what I just heard. And the other thing is to assume positive intent. Uh, at the end of the day, people's uh, belief systems are, you know, what they what they grew up with, their values, their belief systems from forever. And understanding that, I think, helps us become better people as well. Sahara Jackson. Um I had an experience at the ed school last semester. I went to meet with a, an instructor and I used the word prisoner and the instructor was turned off immediately because as we heard from Governor Patrick and others, words matter. And, uh, and sometimes there has to be a process of explaining or an education process around words and tone. And I wonder if you could share how you approach some of those issues in your work at the ed school and elsewhere. Well, I think when you begin to place labels on people, labels become limitations. And so calling someone a prisoner, um, whether or not, or a convict as someone had said uh, a while, you know, you place limitations on people and that is who they become as opposed to seeing uh, the potential that someone has. And um, I just shared with my youngest nephew who is a freshman in college that you are not your worst mistake. And so if we believe that there is redemption for people no matter who they are, then I think we'll have an opportunity to see people in a different light. But if we place labels on individuals, then we'll only see them through a narrow scope. So um, I think the person was right to correct you. Um, and uh, I think if we all just begin to show a little more curiosity about people and not hold us to our lowest, but, you know, think about how we can hold each other to our highest, then we'd be a better place. Now, there are people who choose to um, malign others for the sake of propping themselves up. And I think those people should be called to the carpet for that. So labels are limitations. 
I want to get the uh, economist perspective here. Um, in your analysis, Professor Minkyu, do we have a some kind of civic obligation to go out into spaces beyond the educational setting and um, and make time for people who are not like us? Uh, to what do we, you know, what what do we need to be doing in that respect? Well, I think it's helpful to talk to people who don't agree with you. I have an opportunity to do this often because I'm not a supporter of Mr. Trump, but my sister is. And so we have discussions about it. And when I talk to her about it, I'm usually in the mode of questioning more than arguing, trying to figure out why does she think the way she thinks and why it's so different from the way I think. Um, I find that sort of asking people about their views and trying to probe them is often a non-threatening way of, of understanding people's um, disagreements. Having said that, I should say, by the way, I'm perfectly fine with not everyone being political. I'm deeply interested in politics. I follow politics closely, I vote in every election. But there's some people who say, I, I hate politics. I don't wanna, I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna follow politics. I don't wanna necessarily vote. And then and in a free society, we should be also be open to people like that. Not only people we disagree with, but people who don't wanna even engage in the sort of topics that, that animate us. Do you ever uh, learn anything really interesting and new from your conversations with your sister from those points of disagreement? Well, I understand why she's thinking about things the way she is. And, I, and I, it, it helps me pinpoint, you know, what, what the fundamental differences and assumptions or, or worldviews that we have. So I sort of understand myself better when I sort of sort of say, okay, this is really in, in essence where, where, where we're disagreeing. I don't, I don't try to persuade her I, in the sense that, you know, fa families get, get togethers are fraught enough as it is, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, I, but I learn a lot about sort of di uh, different worldviews. One of the things I'm very sad about is that there's a geographic polarization in this country where it's people are living closer to people who agree with them more than has been true in the past. And that's, I think, unfortunate. I mean, there's some great books out there about uh, trying to understand disagreement. So the one book I strongly recommend is by a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt called The Righteous Mind. It was very good at trying to explain how people on the right and people on the left think about the world differently. And so it's, it's a very, it's, it's, an, it's an edifying book. Thank you. Uh, does any, we did get a question in the Q&A about uh, any, any reading materials that folks would recommend on some of these topics to the extent they wanna go home and practice these ideas themselves. Yeah, I, I have a couple of suggestions in that regard. You know, to Greg's point, I, I, th I, I think it, it is, we should take every opportunity to try to talk to people who have very different views. So, you know, I think people uh, who were, sh you know, shocked or sh surprised by protesters uh, who are advocating for quicker openings when the COVID shutdown should, you know, get in a conversation, figure out, you know, why they wanted things. Maybe their business was dependent on, um, on patronage and, and they should talk to people who thought that, uh, that was important to go out despite the shutdown to participate in a Black Lives Matter protest or advocating for university opening, even though both of those things obviously increase the risk of transmission. You know, we have it kind of on both sides. A couple of reading suggestions because the geographic separation so aligns, so correlates with political views these days. I would recommend a couple of books. Um, one is Strangers in Their Own Land by Arlie Hochschild, who she goes down to Louisiana to really try to, she puts it, climb the empathetic wall to try to understand um, white conservatives who, many of them who end up all of them who end up voting for Donald Trump. Um, and then another book is uh, by, uh, these are two friends, Kathy uh, uh, Kramer called The Politics of Resentment. She's at the University of Wisconsin and she tries to understand rural Wisconsin voters. And one of the things she asked them is, well, what do you think the University of Wisconsin can do for you? Like, how would it be better for you and uh, the modal response is, well, you guys could win a few more football games for us, right? And then, you know, she tries to understand why they're even in Wisconsin, there's this urban rural divide. And part of it is the, uh, the rural informants that she had thinks we have, we in universities have it really, really easy. And so the distinction she makes is, well, you guys are, you 
University, Madison, Wisconsin people are people who take their showers in the morning and we take our showers after work because look, we actually do some work, right? And so it's, I think it's like kind of important to get these different perspectives. I'll chime in with two books uh, that I came across in my coursework here. And I wanna give a shout out to Lisa Leahy uh, two books that I read in her course. Uh, one is Difficult Conversations and the other is Humble Inquiry. And uh, I think to the person who asked the question, yes, it's, it's definitely a starting point that we should look to find the humanity in everyone. And once we acknowledge and recognize that, again, like I said, someone has to be on top in order for you to be on the bottom, then it's difficult to find common ground. And you have to, you know, as Deborah Jill Sherman would say, know when to fold them uh, and walk away. You know, oftentimes you, you cannot uh, build that bridge with someone who does not respect your common humanity. So, Professor Neely, a thought there? Yes, uh, so, so I wanted to recommend the types of books that are in line with some of my suggestions earlier in terms of inquiry mode and learning. And so one would be Appreciative Inquiry, Change at the Speed of Imagination. Um, of course, Carol Dweck's work around growth mindset is versus fixed mindset is also really helpful. And um, Elephant in the Room, How Relationships Make or Break the Success of Leaders and Organizations. And so at the end of the day, wouldn't it be amazing if we are able to have relationships with people who are different from us? I remember a very good friend that my father um, had uh, who they, they both had very different political views, a little bit like you and your sister, Greg, and they would argue like crazy uh, about their perspectives and they've been friends for 40, 50 years. And at the end, it's like, okay, you're hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Okay, let's go eat. They found a way to separate these deep, profound differences they had in perspective and still have an amazing friendship. If one needed something, the other one was there. Um, I mean, in, you know, at my own wedding, who stood with my father was this friend who was with him forever. So it's about the relationship as well. So if we don't have relationships with people who are different from us, we won't have empathy and insight into other people. So developing relationships, in addition to getting educated and reading these books, et cetera, I think is also very important. Understanding the point of view of others, developing empathy. And I think that comes from relationships. I tell my students all the time, if you come to the Harvard Business School and spend all of your time with people who are just like you, you are, significantly um, uh, 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 diminishing your, your experience and your ability to become leaders who can make a difference in the world. Your learning is just drastically diminished. So I actually tell my students, develop relationships with people who are very different from you. Don't get into an in-group and sit there for two years because that would be such a disservice to you and all that you can do in the world. Professor Fung, you, you cited earlier um, the example of, um, of anti-abortion and abortion rights uh, leaders in Boston getting together and having secret conversations for years. Uh, what's the most kind of far out there example of that happening in the present day climate that you can imagine? And let's try to make it happen. Um, I guess there are lots of examples. Um... I don't know exactly how to make them happen. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think it would be like one one playful one playful. That's not certainly not the right word. One ambitious one would be uh, police union leaders and leaders of Black Lives Matter getting together to try to have a conversation and figure out what they 
agree on and disagree on. I think that, so there's a couple questions in the chat that are like, okay, fine. I like, you know, you guys are love to find common ground and the civic discourse language, but what if somebody's really trying to deny your human rights, right? What if, what if there's this like big time oppression going on isn't what you're saying, I think the implication is, is don't you have to put all what you're saying on about civic discourse on hold, right? Um, and I guess what I think about that is uh, you have to try to create a conversation despite that. And the first thing you have to do is insist on the equality of the people who are speaking in the context of speaking. So while I'm sure, Black Lives Matter leaders and police union leaders have very different views about whose rights are being denied to whom. They nevertheless might be able to agree on the ground rules of how to have a conversation with one another. And that's a beginning. Um, I have a couple of good friends who grew up in Ireland and they say, they've both said on separate occasions, when I look at America, uh, I see a divided society and I know divided societies. And you think of the Irish example and many other, and um, you know, whatever, however divided you think we are, you know, Ireland has a fair amount of division. Um, and so do these other societies um, that have gone through serious war and genocide and, um, and other levels of South Africa is another example, apartheid regime for a while. And in those examples, people try to beat each other up and, one side tries to dominate the other. And then in a lot of them, after a while, they kind of get exhausted and they figure out, I can't achieve total victory. And when they can't achieve total victory and they get tired of killing one another, then they figure out terms on which they can live with one another. And, um, and I think some of those examples, our divisions feel like uh, they're huge and they are huge but they're not as wide as some of the ones that I've just discussed in which those sides have managed to figure out how to live with one another and how to at least begin a conversation, even when each feels like the other is violating its basic, basic human rights. And in some of those cases, they are violating their basic human rights. <laughs> they figure out the terms on which they can begin to have a conversation and that's important. Shahara Jackson, I wanna give you the last word in this conversation. Okay, well, um, when uh, Archon was talking about uh, police unions gathering together with Black Lives Matter movement, um, first, I just want to uh, acknowledge my background, which is Breonna Taylor, uh, which uh, her murder has caused a great deal of backlash um, against the backdrop of the brutal murder of so many African Americans in this country. But one, one uh, instance that came across my news feed recently was in Newport News, Virginia, uh, the sheriff or the police chief uh, held a news conference to apologize to one of the Boogaloo boys. I think I'm saying that correctly uh, because he took his gun at a protest. And unbeknownst to the police chief, the Boogaloo boys had uh, met with some of the Black Lives Matter protesters who were unarmed, but who were tear gassed by the police at a rally previous to his gun being taken. And so once the uh, police chief uh, apologized to the Boogaloo boy, he gave him uh, some coffee. The uh, Boogaloo boy brought the Black Lives Matter activists up onto the, the uh, podium where they had a big press conference outside the news, uh, the uh, police precinct. And he said, now my gun was returned. I was giving coffee and you all were tear gassed uh, and you were unarmed. And they came together in the presence of this police chief. And I thought that that spoke to a level of unity that we do not see uh, regarding the right to bear arms and peaceful unarmed protesters being tear gassed while armed militia are 
you know, given coffee and treated fairly and, you know, with some sort of humanity. And so I think once we begin to acknowledge and recognize the level of disrespect that is perpetrated against um, people who are fighting for just the right to exist, I think we would uh, be better served in our country. Um, and so, you know, just thinking about what our, uh, <laughs> the, the occupant of the White House said, you know, what do you have to lose? I think Brianna Taylor answers that question. Thank you so much, Shahara, and all of the panelists for their time and their deep insights in this conversation. I want to bring back in Sherry Charleston, the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer. She has some closing remarks. Thank you all for being here for these important conversations. Um, as you know, um, this is just the beginning of a bigger conversation um, that will go on for um, the rest of the year. Um, you know, we will not find all the answers at one sitting. Um, it will take a continual exploration, continuing to try to think through some of the most difficult questions that face us, um, how we think about these things in a way that ideally allows us to have more people involved in a dialogue about how we shape the future of our country, our institution and the world, including as many voices as we possibly can. Thank you, Carrie, for your moderation. Thank you, Governor Patrick, uh, for your participation and leading us off and giving us an excellent example of what it looks like to shape the future in a way that includes all voices. Thank you to the panelists, um, Shahara, Sadal, Arkan, and Greg. And of course, thank you to Larry Bacow, our president, for his support of this important initiative. We are just starting. And I hope that you all will join us on Friday as we host uh, Theodore, uh, Theodore Olson and Ted Boys, the attorneys who argue Bush v. Gore, as we think about Bush v. Gore at 20. That said, have a wonderful evening. <laughs>